So now the problem with these relaxation methods is that uh, the time scales are still uh, pretty low. Like I said, uh, it goes up to one nanosecond, and uh, the reason is obvious because uh, if you if you think that uh, we are using a short pulse of light, let's say a laser pulse of few nanoseconds, but then uh, it initiates the process, and then you watch the subsequent events uh, by say absorption or emission, whatever and which you can directly uh, see on an electronic device like oscilloscope. Now electronics have their own time scales, it is limited by up to say 1 nanosecond or uh, let us say a fraction of a nanosecond something like that, but not beyond that. However, the dynamics of molecules have a much much uh, faster time scale. To give you a feeling how fast are these dynamics, here uh, we show uh, you first the water molecule. Now water molecule is a simple molecule and as you can see that uh, as you know that it has uh, two OH bonds and then uh, in, in what happens at any temperature these bonds vibrate because the molecule has a vibrational energy uh, which is a 0 point vibrational energy and uh, you can actually think of these vibrations uh, as uh, the combination of vibrations under uh, which is known as normal modes of vibration as a three typical vibration. One is a symmetric stretch which uh, is shown here uh, in this uh, animation where you can see that the two bonds of water are uh, stretching or compressing simultaneously. So that is why it is a symmetric vibration. Similarly, you could have an asymmetric uh, stretching vibration where actually you have one bond stretching but uh, at that time the other bond is compressing. So uh, these uh, two vibrations are basically or two bond vibrations are out of phase. And similarly, you can have a bending motion like the water molecule, uh, these two bonds are bending like this. Now these three vibrations have their characteristic frequencies and they also have a characteristic time period associated with that. Now these time periods will be on the order of picoseconds, uh, few picoseconds to few tens of picoseconds and if it is a low frequency vibration, it can be a uh, few, uh, uh, I mean hundreds of picoseconds to terahertz raging. But those time scales are, are very fast. Because now we are talking about uh, picosecond or sub picosecond dynamics which is like uh, 10 to the power minus 2, minus 12 seconds. And uh, earlier well, the flash photolysis time scale if you remember it was limited by the electronics and that was up to 10 to the power 9 seconds on, on a nanosecond. Now again you see a 3 order of magnitude improvement or beyond that and uh, before we uh, discuss how to tackle this problem which we will anyway discuss very briefly and uh, let us first uh, show you uh, the wide range of chemical and biological processes or what are the time scales associated with these processes. Now for example, uh, what we just said about flash photolysis, uh, with flash photolysis with a microsecond time resolution, you can actually uh, study the dynamics of long lived triplet states or radical precise or some. Uh, I mean traps if you can create some um, uh, iron trap or some other kind of a matrix trap and then you can actually stabilize those places and you can uh, increase their lifetime and you can actually have a look at uh, you can observe it by electronics. However, uh, if you uh, look at it carefully this spontaneous emission or the fluorescence has a lifetime of nanosecond so uh, or slightly more uh, less than nanosecond. So, uh, in order to understand that you need a device which actually works uh, much uh, faster time scale. Now up to this like a uh, fraction of a nanosecond on the order of say 100 picosecond or so, we can still use electronics and uh, for example for fluorescence lifetime measurement, you can actually use a device which is known as a, or, or a method which is known as a time correlated single photon counting method which is known as TCSPC method and what is done there is that uh, you first uh, send a light pulse uh, to the uh, system uh, and then suppose a fluorescent photon is emitted and your detector actually knows when this light pulse was uh, sent and when this fluorescent photon arrives and by uh, uh, I'm actually it is even more complicated than the way I am uh, saying because it involves a lot of uh, intricate details of the electronics. But uh, the overall principle is like you know the when the photon arrived at the sample and when the fluorescent photon emitted and from that you can actually calculate the arrival time of the photons. Uh, if you repeat this experiment for many times you can actually create a histogram and from that actually you can calculate uh, like 
uh, what is the fluorescence lifetime and typically these lifetimes are on the order of one nanosecond or so a few nanoseconds and the resolution you get for every step is uh, something on the order of say uh, 100 picosecond or fraction of a nanosecond or 0 0.1 nanosecond or so. So in this case what you do is that you uh, basically count the arrival time of the fluorescent photon with respect to the excitation photon and you calculate the how many photons uh, are uh, suppose there uh, which arrive at say this time and then how many photons arrived at this time and then you create a histogram like this and uh, if you fit an exponential that will correspond to the fluorescence lifetime. But uh, we can actually apply electronics uh, uh, I mean up to uh, this time scale but not beyond that. So, but you can see that lot of physical and chemical and biological processes happen which are actually in the sub picosecond time scale uh, or picosecond or sub picosecond time scale. For example, church transfer has a typical time scale of uh, 1 picosecond to 100, 100 frames per second to 1 picosecond and vibrational relaxation or vibrational energy transfer or these vibrational motions which we just discussed, they have a typical characteristic time scale of a uh, few tens of picosecond to down to few tens of uh, femtoseconds. Now you need of course a uh, femtosecond pulse uh, which is a much shorter pulse to initiate the process but still you have a problem and the problem is how will you observe the subsequent process. Meaning you can, there are two problems always associated here. One is that you need a very short pulse to initiate the process. If you use a longer pulse, let's say I am using a nanosecond pulse to understand a femtosecond process. So during my excitation, because the nanosecond pulse will keep on exciting the system for one nanosecond and during this one nanosecond time window, the uh, molecule uh, dynamics will also be over because uh, as I said that the vibrational motion happen in the time scale of picosecond. So the bond will vibrate a uh, thousand times say if it, if it has a time scale of 1 picosecond within a time window of 1 nanosecond it will vibrate 1000 times. So uh, you, you, you are actually initiating the process but you cannot observe it because everything is averaged up. So you want to just, uh, you have to just excite the system which is uh, during a time scale which is much shorter than 1 picosecond and with the advent of these sub picosecond lasers or femtosecond lasers you can do it but the question is how will you watch the subsequent events because electronics also fail in this case. So uh, the trick is that you actually use uh, the light pulse itself uh, to uh, control uh, or the, to watch these uh, dynamics and this is usually known as uh, femtosecond spectroscopy uh, and uh, so uh, this is one of the uh, like uh, great achievement technique wise and it's a beautiful spectroscopic techniques and together we uh, call it as a ultrafast dynamics of molecules by ultrafast usually we mean something like which is which lies in the sub nanosecond time scale and it doesn't necessarily mean picosecond or femtosecond it can be an attosecond dynamics also which is 10 to the power minus 18 seconds and today even attosecond lasers are available which can actually uh, enable you uh, to see uh, the dynamics of electronic motions within the molecules or atoms. Now uh, this uh, femtosecond spectroscopy was developed by uh, many scientists uh, like Charles Shank, uh, Robin Hochstrasser, Graham Fleming and Ahmed Zuell uh, and there are many others and uh, Ahmed Zuell was uh, given the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for development of uh, femtochemistry in 1999 and uh, I have here a typical example uh, how this uh, spectroscopy works and uh, this was a work by Ahmed Zuell. And again, uh, remember that uh, here, the first thing is that I will initiate a photo process. Now what I have shown here is a diagram, it's called a potential energy diagram, we'll talk about it in details uh, in the later sections. Now uh, this is typically an energy level diagram of a diatomic molecule. And if you had studied a little bit of quantum mechanics, you know that diatomic vibrations are uh, kind of uh, like you can approximate it as a uh, harmonic motion and uh, at the bottom of the well. So this is the harmonic potential as you can see. Uh, uh, the, in reality it will be anharmonic and then uh, this is the potential in the ground state and the molecule is a diatomic molecule which is sodium iodide and this molecule was taken in the gas phase because sodium iodide you can actually heat and then it can form uh, a gas phase. So then uh, you have sodium atom and irm atom and they are doing this vibration. 
Now uh, it has an interesting uh, uh, energy. So in the excited state, when you uh, excite this sample, so it can dissociate in two different ways. Either actually you can dissociate it in a ionic form, where basically the it dissociate as Na plus and I minus, or you could dissociate it as a NaI, where you have Na atom and I atom. So it's a kind of atomic dissociation versus ionic dissociation. Now if you follow this path, you will dissociate into a covalent way, or if you follow this path, you will dissociate in an ionic way. But these are just the details. Now what is done in spect uh, femtosecond spectroscopy, what Amazon and co-workers did is to understand how this dissociation process happens in the excited state. So what they did is that uh, initially you can think when no light is present, uh, the molecules are all in the ground state here, ground electronic state. And then first uh, he, from the laser, he launched a pulse which will excite the molecules in the excited state and the molecules will all come here but in the excited state now they do this vibration. Now vibration of the molecule means actually now that you have sodium atom and the iodine atom and this is basically a stretching dynamics which you just showed in the water molecule. The water was more complicated because it has three vibrations. In this case it is a diatomic molecule it has only one vibration so it is much more uh, simpler system. And then uh, what happens after certain time you can actually launch a probe pulse which is shown here and then the second pulse actually excites the dissociated uh, sodium uh, atoms which is shown here to some excited state and you have seen sodium lamp on straight and this is the same excitation. So you excite the sodium atom and then you see the fluorescence from the sodium atom which actually has a very typical wavelength which is a, uh, he was detecting at uh, 615 uh, nanometer or something. Now what is this experiment? So I will excite the sodium iodide molecules in the excited state and then once it stretches some molecules actually stretch too much that the bond breaks and it breaks as a sodium and iodine and then the probe pulse comes and it will excite the sodium atoms to see uh, the fluorescence and the amount of the fluorescence will be directly proportional to how many sodium atoms I have produced during this dissociation process. Now what Amazon and co-workers did the, he launched the pump pulse and after certain time he launched the probe pulse and this certain time they could control just by using an interferometric setup like you split the pump and the probe and then you recombine and then in one uh, arm uh, where the probe pulse is going so that mirror or some reflecting uh, uh, some reflector you just move. So if you, you can actually move with a very very precise delay that will translate to a temporal delay. Uh, which is on the order of uh, a fraction of a femtosecond. So you are initiating the process with a femtosecond pulse and then you are launching another femtosecond pulse which is time delayed with respect to the first pulse and what I will do is that I will just measure this uh, signal which is the fluorescence from the sodium as a function of this time delay. Now let us see the animation it will be more clear. Suppose first the pump pulse comes and this is basically the time delay as I am showing in that green arrow. The green arrow is also shown here it is basically the time delay between the blue pulse and the red pulse. So blue is the pump pulse and red is the probe pulse. So this technique is known as pump probe technique because you are pumping the system and then after certain time you are probing the system and you are varying this time delay between the pump pulse and the probe pulse. Now what happens here let us see the animation. First uh, suppose the molecules are in the ground state and then you launch uh, a pump pulse that will excite the molecules in the excited state and moment they go there so then they move and some fraction as you can see has leaked here. So this fraction means actually some fraction of molecules have dissociated not all the molecules and because some molecules will actually come back uh, from, uh, from this well and some molecule will leak there are many details. Uh, for this potential energy surface, I am not going into the details of that why uh, some molecules, uh, why there is a fraction of the molecules uh, which are leaking or, or which are dissociating. Now uh, then the probe pulse is very much tuned to the sodium absorption. So it does not, uh, the probe pulse is not absorbed by the sodium iodide. Uh, like the pump pulse is absorbed only by the sodium iodide molecules, the probe pulse is only absorbed by the sodium atoms. And the probe pulse will come and it will excite this sodium atom which is here and then you will see the fluorescence from the sodium. 
And once you see this fluorescence, and then you record the fluorescence as a function of pump probe delay. So what will happen here, suppose at time zero, I launch the pump and probe together. And then what will happen, the molecules are just in the excited sodium iodide, but they have not dissociated by that time. So you'll have almost zero signal at uh, time, uh, at uh, zero time. So here actually the zero time is shifted, uh, but uh, originally the zero will be here. So here actually it is shifted according to the maximum of the signal. After certain time, if you just launch the probe pulse after some delay, you will see that you have some sodium which is building up. Now you will have a huge buildup of sodium and that buildup will correspond to at what time it actually dissociated. At that time it will have a maximum number of sodium atoms. And then if you repeat this process, you will see that uh, these molecules, the sodium atom uh, will, uh, of fluorescence will have an oscillation which will directly correspond to this excited state oscillation. Now what is happening, suppose again in a very simpler word, uh, suppose you had started with 100 molecules each time. So you shine your light pulse, 100 molecules go in the excited state uh, and uh, suppose uh, you started with 200 molecules and 100 molecules goes into the excited state. Now all these molecules are doing vibrations. Now suppose 10 percent of them uh, gets uh, dissociated. So 10 molecules come out as Na plus I. Those 10 molecules you probe with your probe pulse where actually instead of the molecules you are probing the sodium atom which is a dissociated product and then you see the characteristic fluorescence from the excited state that you measure. Now what is happening here after certain time these 90 molecules are left they are again doing vibration again in the next vibration 10 percent will uh, dissociate it. So you see a 9 molecules coming out okay and you are left with basically 81 molecules and then in the next vibration you will get 10% of 81 molecules something like that. So every vibration is making you uh, uh, a lesser and lesser number of dissociation, uh, absolute amount of dissociation that is why you see a decay in this uh, dissociation. Okay? But uh, the interesting thing is that this uh, uh, the sodium atom fluorescence actually picks up right at a regular interval and this interval directly corresponds to how the molecule was moving in the excited state. So this is uh, generally known as a pump uh, probe spectroscopy uh, as I uh, already have said and uh, this is a very advanced spectroscopic technique uh, but uh, there are also other many other advanced spectroscopic techniques particularly which are developed uh, with a low time resolution as well as those uh, which are developed uh, with uh, similar time resolution but uh, where actually you can uh, not only do the gas phase studies but also uh, work in condensed phase or in uh, solution phase because uh, most of the chemistry and almost all the biology happens in uh, solution phase. Uh, now I uh, will conclude our discussion on this uh, kinetic measurement here. So to summarize what we said is that we first started with uh, some uh, traditional uh, 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 approach where actually you can measure the kinetics which uh, often we, you do in the laboratory experiment which is a part of your uh, lab course where actually do uh, something like say titration based uh, techniques okay but that has a uh, resolution on the order of say uh, one minute or say tens of a second and then uh, the next big achievement was uh, basically flow and stock flow method and with these techniques, you could achieve uh, up to 1 millisecond time resolution, something like that. And then came uh, the era of uh, uh, flash photolysis. And uh, the way to flash photolysis we described how uh, basically the developments in photographic techniques uh, or uh, which is known as uh, stroboscopy. It's, it's, it's a, it has a very uh, typical name. Stroboscopy means actually use a light pulse, flash, uh, light flash to capture uh, fast events. And uh, using uh, this uh, flash photolysis, uh, initially it was achieved uh, like um, with microsecond resolution and subsequently people went to down to one nanosecond resolution. And then came the era of uh, ultrafast uh, spectroscopy where uh, you cannot actually 
uh, use uh, electronics because uh, this is uh, basically the limitation of electronics. You can initiate the very fast process with the nanosecond or femtosecond pulses, but you have to watch it over time. So uh, this is uh, basically uh, the window where electronics can uh, participate and uh, electronics can actually work. But uh, below this uh, time window electronics does not work. And then there was a uh, development of ultrafast spectroscopy where actually uh, you detect uh, something, uh, but the detection events is not uh, time result. What instead what you do is that your time resolution comes from the delay between the two pulses, which you can very precisely uh, give and you just look at the absolute signal. So your detection, uh, you do not need a very fast electronics, you need a slow electronics where you are detecting the entire fluorescence when the pump and probe pulses are say 100 frame per second apart. Then you again change the delay to 200 frame per second, again you collect the total fluorescence, something like that was the experiment. So the delay is entirely coming from this part which is basically a mirror movement and with which I, as I said that you can achieve uh, sub uh, femtosecond uh, delay step also. So uh, right now with the current status uh, of ultrafast spectroscopy, we have down to few tens of uh, attosecond resolution. Remember one attosecond is uh, 10 to the power minus 18 second, one nanosecond is uh, 10 to the power minus 9 second, one microsecond is 10 to the power minus 6 second and one millisecond is 10 to the power minus 3 second. Thus we see with the development of technology how uh, we started this discussion and we said that this is basically uh, mankind's uh, attempt uh, uh, for this uh, race against time. So uh, we want to uh, win our uh, against uh, uh, time so that we can actually observe very very fast events in nature. Now uh, before I conclude I would like to make one comment. Uh, so uh, chemical reactions or uh, biochemical reactions or phys physical processes uh, have widely varying time scales. Like uh, if you think that all chemical reactions are ultra fast, it is not true because we gave you examples like for example generation of radicals or uh, species or long lived triplet state, those are rather slow and those you can actually study with microsecond uh, dynamics, microsecond resolution. And then uh, there are many events which uh, for which you can uh, a nanosecond uh, uh, spectroscopy will be good enough or a picosecond spectroscopy will be good enough. You do not always need uh, femtosecond spectroscopy for that. And there are extremely slow reactions also. For example, uh, say uh, fossil formation. Now fossil formation is a very much chemical process, but it, its time scale is on the order of geological time scale at millions of years. So, and those processes you cannot actually study within your lifetime because we also uh, live for a certain time. So you, you act for those cases, you actually try to simulate the experiment uh, so that actually you see uh, uh, try to actually uh, ha make this process happen very quickly so that you can actually study it in real time. So there are ultra slow processes and there are difficulties with ultra slow processes to study because you cannot just study the, it in real time because you won't live longer enough. And there are also ultra fast processes and there are many challenges uh, in uh, ultra fast processes itself. So the bottom line here is that uh, in chemical kinetics you actually deal with uh, um, various uh, processes with uh, widely varying time scales. But uh, uh, most of uh, the processes which we will study is at the atomic or molecular level uh, dynamics which occur on the order of say uh, picosecond to sub picosecond time scales and ultrafast spectroscopy is the lifeline uh, for those processes. Now we will not further discuss uh, this uh, kinetic measurements and uh, then uh, but we will uh, come back and discuss a little bit about how reactions work uh, when we discuss about the uh, molecular reaction dynamics section. Thank you.